Hi, so today we've got this to look at. This is a Ubitricity smart charging cable for electric cars. This is designed to be used in conjunction with roadside charge points, most commonly put in um, lamp posts and other existing street furniture. Currently about 4,000 of these around London. I think I first saw one of these at an exhibition sort of two or three years ago and sort of didn't really pay that much attention thought you know what's this you know ridiculous big up ugly thing and a cable doing um, so I didn't really sort of think much much more of it um, but a couple of weeks ago I was walking around London I saw one of these in use thought oh that's interesting might be in, make an interesting tear down one of those and then about three days later I got on eBay saved certain search notification saying there was one on eBay so I have no memory of setting up that saved search for this thing but it must say must have been at least two years ago that I set up that um, search so um, we actually now got one and uh, I'm gonna have a look at it now the reason for having this sort of big lump in there is that they've taken a slightly different approach to a conventional charge point. You're on a normal AC charge point, um, the charge point handles everything and you just use a dumb passive cable to connect to the car. So the charge point will handle the authorization, billing, metering, etc. The approach they've taken is, well, okay, let's try and make the charge point as cheap as possible so we can have as many of them as possible and then shift some of that cost onto the actual people that are that need to use them so you could sort of kit out a whole street full of you could sort of kit out a whole street full of chargers at fairly low cost because you're using the existing electrical infrastructure and the, and the existing lamp posts so you're not digging holes in the ground burying cables so the actual installation cost is really just replacing the cover of the existing lamp post and doing a little bit of wiring so it's obviously much much cheaper to install and the concept is that all the lamp post is it's a standard EVSE. The only additional thing is there's some authentication so that only one of these will actually turn it on. The normal cable won't. Now they seem to have moved away from this model now in that I don't think they're actually selling these anymore and the, a lot of the newer ones they're installing you do actually work as standalone points they've got a QR code you can scan the QR code and it's authenticated that way so they must presumably have a cellular um, modem inside. But so the concept of this one was that all the billing and metering was actually handled by this and not by the roadside infrastructure. So the idea is you buy one of these, uh, the cost, there was, there were two versions, there was a 4.6 kilowatt one for £200, 7.4 kilowatt version for £300, that's 20 and 32 amp respectively, single phase. And then you have a subscription which I think is £8 a month and I think it's about 25p per kilowatt hour. One issue of course is different lampposts will have different capacities and how much power they, they've been wired for so it could be as low as three kilowatts it could be as high as seven kilowatts but these are primarily designed for residential areas where you know it's for people where there aren't driveways for people to charge to charge in their own parking space the concept is that these are for like fairly long periods like 10 12 hour charge periods so the the fact they're not sort of full seven or 11 kilowatts doesn't actually matter that much what's important is really to get as much coverage as possible in terms of area at minimum installation cost so th this thing has a selling modem in it you plug in uh, the charge point tells this what the actual charge point number is that they plugged into their back end system then knows where that is it also can know things like what the current capacity is not only for that charge, charge point for the whole streets particularly if you're using existing you know, lighting electrical in infrastructure it may well be like okay, we can pull say four kilowatts from each lamp post but the total load over that whole street is going to be limited so if you've got you know, a number of these in use then the system can in principle tell each cable how much current to draw it's allowed to draw and for example as more cars plug in it can reduce it as they unplug or charges re uh, cars reach their 100 percent charge and disconnect then it can provide more power to um, other users the billing works effectively directly with the electricity supply so the, the council whose lamppost these are installed in doesn't really have to get involved in any of those it's, the idea is not a fairly low friction installation process the the more recent ones as i said seem to be fairly self-contained so i think they've probably abandoned this concept for new years it is still supported but uh, i don't think uh, they're selling them anymore because obviously there's a yeah, quite substantial cost also obviously having these plugged in on street it's a targets for vandalism people might think these were sort of valuable they're sort of fairly sort of big big lumpy things there's a few sort of interesting questions you know how does it how does this authentication stuff work with the charge point and how yeah you know, how's how's the actual metering done and the the authentication side of things you know, it could be anything from like a simple signal saying hi i'm a smart charge thing turn, turn on please to like a full yeah, challenge response encrypted thing so that the yeah that could in theory go all the way back to the server over the cellular modem although there is provision for charging where there's no cellular signal 
Um, for example, if it's in something like an underground car park, so there is a way for the system to pre-authorise this for a few charges, after which it then needs to call home to refresh it. So that would probably rule out a full, you know, end-to-end authorization or an authentication where the, um, yeah, the charge point sends a challenge that goes all the way back to their server and then gets a response from that. Um, this does have a fairly big, big battery. I'm not saying that situation. You do the charge, and then once that got moved to an area where it, it did have cellular service, it would then be able to do the communications to relay back the bill information um, reauthorize any you know, I think they say you can have up to three charges before it has to call home and this will also work as a simple dumb cable for use on you know, traditional charge points the you know, the mains connection goes straight through and when it's unpowered there's actually a relay that just relays the uh, charge pilot signal all the way through so this can just be used as a, a standard type 2 um, single phase charge cable if you want to so you don't have to take this and another cable with you so as, as well as having the simplicity of the infrastructure the other advantage is because the authentication is in this literally just plug in and it'll start charging you don't there's no user interaction needed so if you're doing if you're using this as your normal charging method it, it is a bit more convenient than having to scan the qr code on the um, charge point and go through an app and so on but i think um you know the cost of this probably outweighs those minor um, advantages and if you look at the um the design of the what needs to go in the lamppost Without this, yeah, that needs to do the monitoring of the amount of electricity used and have some sort of cellular modem in it or some sort of network connection. Yeah, that, that is extra additional cost, but probably once you get into high volumes, it's maybe less of an issue. Um, one thing is when you're charging for electricity by the kilowatt hour, there are certain regulations that dictate the accuracy of that measurement because obviously, you know, you're selling someone, it's a um, same thing about yeah for example scales in shops need to be um, calibrated and so on so that you, you know that you're charging the correct price but I think with with suitable integration that's probably not going to add a huge amount of cost and size to the lamppost possibly one of the other you know, the more pressing issues is you know, getting a cellular um, a cellular modem inside a lamppost which is obviously mostly metal is where do you actually put the antenna now I've had a quick look at a couple of the, the ones that, yeah, that will work with a standard dumb cable and I couldn't see any obvious antenna you know I, I couldn't see any for example non-conductive patches on the cover and i was thinking perhaps that yeah they could perhaps put it on the actual flap on the um the charge port but uh it was it was getting a bit dark so i didn't have time to look at it in too much detail but uh, i'd be interested to know how they um how they manage that in practice the model on this is that yeah the user actually buys these it's not like a lease or subscription type model which i, I thought was a little bit surprising so yeah the question is yeah this is the thing providing the authentication and the billing you know how secure is this yeah what have they done to um, prevent people sort of either just making something to plug in to use it for free or doing something to this to um, make it either dispense for free or not charge as much as it should so we'll see if there's any uh, anti-tamper type stuff going on and get to see if we can get some idea of how the um, security side of things works i'd imagine they're yeah they're probably going to be using the uh, the, the sort of two signals on a uh, charge cable as um control pilot and proximity pilot um, the control pilot is used for the car to signal its status and also for the charge point to signal to the car how much current it's allowed to draw the proximity pilot is basically a sort of plug insert detection the other function is that for a, um for example on a dumb cable there's a resistor inside the plug that tells the charge point in the car how much current the cable can take regardless of what the charge point says is available via its pwm signal on the control pilot if i was designing a system like this where yeah, this has to signal to a, a custom charge point i'd probably be doing using the proximity pilot because the car doesn't really care about that it's just seeing a resistor at the far end of the cable so the charge point can do whatever it likes pretty much with the proximity pilot and the car won't know so i think any signaling is probably going to be done through that to avoid any clashes with any of the um, control pilot functionality so looking at the outside so the you know the first impression is this thing is you know why is it this big um i think one answer is if we look here it looks like they've actually used like an off-the-shelf din rail electricity meter to do the metering now i suspect the main reason for that is approvals again like i said if you're charging people for electricity there are regulations that dictate the accuracy of that certainly for this which was probably done as initially as a pilot in relatively low volumes it was probably cheaper just to use an off-the-shelf meter that's already been approved and had all the you know, the um, accuracy approvals done than 
roll your own you know measuring electricity isn't that hard but it's probably a fairly expensive process to go through the certification of the accuracy to satisfy any regulations that apply to supplying electricity so that's probably one reason that it's this size there does seem to be a lot a lot in here but i suspect again that's probably because they didn't want to put a huge amount of investment into miniaturizing this until they're sure it was more of a um sort of goer in terms of product one of the some of their literature says that you know what they'd like to see is this functionality in, included in the car but frankly i can't really see that happening i think you know that the whole charging landscape is sort of quite diverse there's so many players that i think it's it seems improbable that any car manufacturer would be interested in sort of integrating something into the car that was specifically for that uh, manufacturer and there are upcoming standards um the iso or whatever it is for the um, v2g has provision in there for ac charging and sort of authentication and billing through there so i think if that happens it's going to be happen happening that way rather than um via a sort of proprietary system like this and i think this meter is possibly the only reason they done that they didn't done it in a sort of transparent case I suppose potentially you could use a transparent case to make it obvious if someone's sort of modifying it or doing anything naughty with it. But I think it may well just simply be so you can see this, um, the count on this meter when it's powered up. You can see that the battery is a fairly big battery in there. And obviously that's needed because you know, when you first plug in, there's no power available. That you know, it's, a, it's a fairly standard EVSE, so it will only turn mains on once it's firstly done the authentication and then got the um, signal from the car to request the uh, charge. So this is basically working off batteries and then just recharges when it's actually involved in an active charge scenario. The only manual I could find was a German one. Uh, this Uvitricity is a German company. Translating that, they say that if the battery goes, goes completely flat, then you just plug it into a charge point for like four hours. But as far as i can see unless there's some special mode where it can turn you know the charge point knows that it's got a dead one these plugged in and can turn the power on i can't quite see how that's going to work because yeah, if this battery is totally flat then it can't do the communications to actually authenticate and turn the charge point on so before we take it uh, completely to bits um, i think it would be worth taking a trip to a local charge point with this um tiny but utterly dreadful little portable scope and um, see if we can see what's actually going on on the interface yeah, apologies for quality, I was trying to hold the charger and hold the, hold the phone and get something happening. So you can see it does do quite a lot of serial cons. This is, as I suspected, on the proximity pilot line. So it sits there for quite a few seconds, sort of spitting quite a lot of data out. Interestingly, it did get to the point of asking me to connect the car, but it then didn't do anything. I either got continuous orange or a red light on the charger. What's really stupid is that it doesn't actually give you any information. You've got this nice high-res display on the unit, but it doesn't give you any meaningful error message. You just sort of, the light goes red and the display goes out, and you haven't got a clue why it's failed, which is uh, pretty dumb. And if we zoom in on faster scope setting, the comms are at 19.2k board. This is sort of clearly quite a lot of data, so I'm pretty sure it's doing a sort of fairly high, yeah, sophisticated challenge response type thing. I'm not going to bother dumping it. I don't think it's really uh, worth doing. Let's see what this does when it's powered up. I uh, haven't got the right socket, but I just do happen to have some spare pins from a, uh, an old uh, connector, which fit quite nicely. Okay, so it powers on. Ubertristy logo. So I presume this is trying to talk to the server. And this mode there's the sim menu, current session, some parameters, software update log. Don't seem to be any other functionality, the buttons don't seem to allow you to select anything. Just thank you. And then it goes to sleep. And if it's powered up you can actually power it up from the internal battery. If you hold one and the tick button down for a few seconds. Basically it does the same thing. As far as I can tell, they don't actually really use these buttons for anything. Obviously, that there's the potential for having on maybe pin controlled access or anything, but uh, the manual I could find didn't really mention anything about making use of that apart from just the button combination to wake it up. And so, look at what it's actually communicating. I'm just looking at the um, spectrum coming from the antenna so we can see when it's uh, trying to transmit. Um, this is a 3G comms module in here. So they've got a signal that's around 905 megahertz. I'm 
and I have seen it transmit on another channel as well but obviously that pretty depends on what the um, base station is doing at the time a few little short bursts there so taking the cover off we've got sort of this big board in the front cover in the back we've just got the battery and the um, electricity meter with various connectors coming onto the uh, front board so this is the um, proximity pilot and control pilot from the uh, charge point got an earth battery connector there's a few pins on there so we've probably got balance inputs and um, thermistor i'd imagine real-time clock backup battery this uh, wire here goes to the um the there's a usb micro socket on the side of it we've got um, a uh, sub board which is uh, an off-the-shelf computer on module type board with an imx6 processor on it mains power supply so we've got the uh, Live and neutral, these are tapped off the um, incoming mains from the uh, charge cable and a wire going to the outgoing control pilot to the car. Interesting, these are actually using the same connector, so it, it is sort of just about possible to plug these into the wrong, so wrong, wrong socket. They're not keyed in any, anyway, I'm not quite sure they've used single um, connectors rather than a multi way one. Then there's this connector here, this goes to the electricity meter. This has got a pulse output for real time energy and also a uh, Modbus RS 485 interface, which obviously that's using to get the um, billing information out of the meter. Taking a closer look at the PCB, these are just wires that I've tacked on for some serial uh, logging, so ignore those. And there's a massive great earth terminal, I'm not quite sure why it's so big. There's a 220 ohm resistor, this is for the proximity pilot on that there's a relay here this is used to switch the control pilot so that when this is being used in dumb charger mode it just passes the control pilot straight through to the uh, car this is the usb connection there's a micro usb on on the side here with a sort of rubber bung uh, this is an adum 4160 usb isolator by analog devices so the uh, usb port is sort of galvanically isolated which i don't quite see why because i mean the rest of this um circuitry isn't yeah, anywhere near mains and it does share a common with the uh, the mains earth so perhaps that's why they decided to isolate it i'm not really sure what this is for it's probably just things like firmware updates and maybe sort of getting log information out there's nothing in any documentation i can find about that it doesn't even acknowledge its existence as a real-time clock 32 kilo oscillator chip um 2450 lithium cell running real-time clock so this is a um an imx6 sort of freescale stroke nxp um processor sort of fairly high end processor i don't know whether this is running linux or something a bit more bare metal it seems a bit of overkill really for what they uh, what they're using it for i've got mains power supply here sort of mains in here and yeah, everything you expect from normal sort of power supply you can see the isolation barrier through the pcb here a few inductors and power supply components um there's a flex from the um keypad here and a flex from the lcd going on here if we take the um, computer on module, so this is just an off-the-shelf module. So obviously, if you're using processors that need all these sort of BGA pins and everything, this board has almost certainly got quite a lot more layers than this. So it'd be expensive to make a sort of great big board with all this stuff directly on it. But also, just the engineering effort in producing this, you know, it's it's quite common to use these modules where you need like a high-density processor on a sort of board that's more sort of conventional. I doubt this board is more than um, four layer. And you can see there's also provision here for a shielding can around here which they uh, haven't fitted. It's actually sort of surprising amount of stuff there's just lots of power supply and sort of few analog bits and pieces here. And down here we've got uh, an NXP A7002 which is a secure microcontroller. It's sort of similar sort of functionality to the chips that are in smart cards so it's got provision for all sorts of encryption authentication type things so this is probably what they're using for authentication to the charge point maybe also some encryption of some of the stuff they send over the air. That's just a lead that I tacked on just to show that the mains is on. Uh, inside the front cover we've got the LCD, the cellular antenna, so it's just got a sort of pattern of it's probably like a thin PCB or a copper foil type thing. And this little PCB has just got the uh, USB socket on it. And the front PCB is actually mounted in the, the sort of soft rubber shock mount. So these sort of clip onto the corners of the PCB and then they're just a push fit into these holes. So it gives a nice sort of shock protected uh, mounting to the PCB. Back of the PCB, we've got a cellular modem from Telet. No sign of a SIM card, but there is a chip here which I suspect might be the equivalent of a SIM card. On a, sort of on a chip, just looking at the way the pins are connected and then just a few sort of power supply bits 
That's the transformer for the isolated power supply for the isolated USB interface capacitor, which is part of the power supply. This is all the uh, power supply parts. This is a TNY290, I think it's power integration, sort of switch mode uh, power supply controller. The weird package, obviously for heat dissipation, also for isolation on that pin. And this is just the common mode filter for the uh, filtering the incoming main supply. Service mount fuse here. And this is a MAX3070, this is an RS485 transceiver for the uh, Modbus interface to the electricity meter. One interesting detail, this uh, big ground connector is actually a press fit into the PCB. Obviously something with that amount of thermal mass will be diff difficult to solder. So this sort of fits into um, PCB holes that are just the right size to be a friction fit. A bit overkill because say so this is just a, yeah this isn't carrying any significant amount of power so uh, I'm not quite sure why they use something sort of as big a chunk as this rather than just for example these yeah, single pole connectors they'd used elsewhere. And in the back we've just got the battery this looks like um, either an off the shelf or sort of customised battery pack just two 18650s and a protection board on there nothing uh, exciting. This is uh, 7.2 volts 2.9 amp power and we've got this uh, DIN rail electricity meter and if we power this up Display test shows the uh, firmware version, presumably. And we see this little dot showing communication. So this is the um, Ubertristi uh, unit talking to it over the uh, Modbus. And here we've got the, presumably the reading, 70.98. Various other bits of um, information. I think this just cycles through different readings. I think you configure this to show all sorts of different information. I think the T might be for different tariffs perhaps. I don't think that don't know whether this uses that or not. Perhaps it uses one tariff for when it's in its smart cable mode and one when it's dumb in dumb mode. Because so if this is being used as a dumb cable, you're still going to get power going through this and being measured by the meter source. So it needs to keep track of which power it's actually looking at to charge from, which it's just um, being used as a passive cable. So this is in a like a single module DIN rail mount. So this is very common for you know, in industry couple of reasons they've done this in a clear case obviously one so you can just see the display through it but it may also be so you can see if there's any sort of tampering or anything going on and you can just see in here the sort of we've got neutral in that one side live in and out on the other side and we see there's this uh, shunt on each side for measuring the current actually I think that looks like a copper bus bar so I think it's only this end which is the live in and out is actually monitored I think neutral is just tied so we've got this uh, assembly of a few PCBs here so we can see this is clearly the um, the current shunt. We've got two separate uh, connections to measure each side of it here, whereas this is just connected straight across for the um, the neutral. Got, I think this looks like a resistor and some heat shrink there. Capacitor, presumably for some uh, transient suppression. Capacitor, that's probably a capacitive dropper for supply. And LCD on the top, sort of solder straight down onto this PCB. And there's a LED, there might be, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a um, photo transistor here as well. It's quite common to have optical interfaces into metering equipment, so you can read them out from that. Yeah, actually if we look closer, that does actually say IR LED. So I think that's probably an infrared LED and that'll be the um, receiver. And I think this is actually a touch button red marker on here. So I think the idea is that's a touch button so you can select what it displays. And there's a piece of plastic on here. I think the reason for that is that for touch sensing, you don't want to have an air gap between where you touch it and where the um, the conductor is, because that massively reduces the coupling capacitance. I think we've got a piece of plastic on here. So the idea is that when this is in here, that's then in very close contact with you know, this label in here. So there's a minimal air gap to maximise the amount of capacitance you can get by uh, yeah through this um, plastic casing. This is a touch button, you can just sort of touch this to scroll through the various different uh, display modes. Okay, so I've unsoldered this into its pieces. This looks like a uh, power supply board. I thought this, originally thought this was a capacitive dropper supply, but I wonder if maybe this is actually a dropper that's being used to do the uh, voltage measurement. And the main board got the LCD on top. There's a, uh, this actually is surprising. This seems to be a fairly generic microcontroller. This is a SinoWealth SH79F64, which is an 8051 based microcontroller. 
can't actually see anything that's amplifying the signal from this uh, current sensor. There's a, sort of few, there's a few passives on here, but there's you know, op amps or anything. I think it's only got an 8 or 10 bit ATC converter on it. So that's a little bit surprising. You know, presumably this would do um, sort of true RMS as well. So I suppose it's only at sort of 50, 60 hertz, so it's maybe feasible to do all that in software. It doesn't need to very, have a very high update rate. It's just a little squared prom there for configuration setting. Now you've got two opto isolators here. Um, this will be for the Modbus serial interface. And there's an interface here which is uh, like a pulse output, which is quite common on meters. You could, you and this is an insulating separator here. Actually, I'm not sure this is a power supply because I'm not seeing any mains voltage electrolytics on this thing. Honestly, you wouldn't need any for capacitive dropper supply. And that's uh, 470 microfarad, so I'd thought that would be able to do, you know, low tens of milliamps. Perhaps this is um, more to do with the measurement side of things. Interesting on this, you can sort of see where the idea comes from, you know, keep the um, charge points as cheap as possible. Yeah, they don't seem to have done much to sort of try and reduce the cost of this thing. Yeah, I think they, the, um, the cost was uh, £300. Probably aren't making much money on this. This could have been engineered a lot cheaper. I don't know whether they maybe thought, well, you know, if we're charging the customer for it, the cost doesn't matter too much. But, you know, you've, we've got this meter, we've got this very expensive, very detailed moulded case. We've got this probably sort of overkill processor. We've got the USB interface that doesn't really seem to do, do much. I mean, if you're going to sort of engineer this concept, yeah, there's lots of ways it could be done cheaper. For example, you could probably provide enough power at, say, 12 or 24 volts out of the PP line at the charge point to not need the power supply in here. The battery is only really needed for situations where there's no cellular service at the charge point. Yeah, if these, these things are mostly on street, that's probably not going to be a major issue. Yeah, there might be some situations like underground garages, but I think, you know, it seems quite a lot of sort of cost to just deal with that particular situation. And, you know, we've got this sort of, you know, nice sort of Tyrus TFT display and keypad that are really not not even really used for anything so whether this was a concept and they were looking at other applications that, that never really happened I, I don't know but say as far as i can tell these aren't for sale anymore so they you know, they seem to have probably abandoned this idea and if you look at their map a large proportion of the current charge points are designed to use with a, um, a standard dumb cable because of course the other issue yeah most people will probably already have a dumb cable anyway so you know it's just buying extra hardware that um, most EV users will, you know, will already have so uh, yeah a bit of a bit of an interesting one just, you know, I'm sure there's probably some history and in some internal politics and other things. I mean, I do wonder if you know, the reason for this, using this metering was not so much the difficulty in doing it, but just the cost of approvals and so on and the time it takes. Um, again, if you know anything about that, uh, please add it, add it in the comments. But um, as I say it does seem to be sort of quite seriously over-engineered for the task that it was um, meant to do. And so the... Um, just adding in terms of the cost of the lamppost charge you know, charge points all they really need is the yeah you know, the cellular connectivity which is sort of simple enough just with a small module and uh yeah you know, a suitably accurate uh, metering which again that's yeah that's not rocket science if you see what's yeah you know, what's in this there really isn't much that's specific to the monitoring you know you've got the processor and display and all that sort of stuff and obviously that could easily be integrated onto this all you need is the voltage measurement and a um the current shunt part of it so yeah that wouldn't cost that much to integrate into the charge point so um yeah strange one so if anyone has any more background information please uh, leave it in the comments and the security side of things you know assuming they're using this sort of authentication chip um to enable the charge point i mean that seems sort of reasonable although obviously you know if you're really determined you could just take the uh, take the cover off the lamp post and stick some croc clips in but uh, the only other issue is you know potentially you know there is a potential vulnerability and you could you know, pull power from this side before the um the meter now i'd imagine they've probably got some detection so if it's sat there for like quite a long time not actually drawing any current through here it might sort of cut out and assume that um something's gone wrong but uh, you know you would potentially be able to just sort of maybe just mess with that shunt resistor so it only ever registers half of um half of what you use probably a, a, as secure as it needs to be um most of the time